Hello and thank you so much for coming by the channel today. I really appreciate it. My name is Susan and this channel is Road Reads and today is an August reading wrap up. It was a great reading month. I ended the summer strong with eight reads this month and also I feel like I I went across the spectrum of genres a bit, although it was a little Agatha Christie heavy, but I read things that were so not Agatha Christie-like. So let's get started. I, I won't even talk about the first one because I have talked in depth about it, but the first book I finished this month was Agatha Christie's Perot, which I recommended highly if you are an Agatha Christie fan or a Perot fan, get it, read it so good and then the next one i read was an agatha christie book and i believe it's from 1964 and that's a caribbean mystery i don't think we chatted about this book there's not much to say like i said it's from the mid 1960s which those type of agatha christie books it's always like ah kids these days which is kind of fun but this is a miss marple book and i haven't read a lot of miss marple books and i i quite enjoyed it it was a three like a really good three star for me i had heard someone review it it was mitzi at mitzi reads and writes she loved it i believe it was a five star for her i i don't want to misspeak i'll link her channel below uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I, I feel like somewhat of a jerk to give it three plus stars, but uh, there were just things with the plot, which you know what? I mean, really doesn't matter when you're reading Agatha Christie. I am not, I am not, when I'm reading her books, I'm not looking for holes in the plot or anything like that. And like I said, Miss Marple. So, you know, our elderly sleuth is, is in the Caribbean and hanging out with some younger folk there's murder in and intrigue as per usual and I, I really don't think you need to know more about what that book is about <laughs> anyway if you enjoy agatha christie you will enjoy it after that again i won't talk about it again other than to say i five starred and patchett's most recent release tom lake it was uh it was my kind of book and I hope some of you, I know not all of you, but I hope some of you read it and really enjoy it as much as I did. I will say this, I mentioned when I was reviewing that book that there was such a feeling of contentment when you read that book, especially from our main character. And I only mention that because I would like to juxtapose it with another book I'm going to talk about in a minute. But before I do, again, I've already talked to you about my next read after Tom Lake. Of course, I had to reread Thornton Wilder's play, Our Town. Love it. Five stars. Okay, so contentment in Tom Lake. It, 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 it just made me happy. I mean, I love sad, miserable books. I told you last year when I read Tess of the Durbervilles, I may have just read one of the best written books of all time. Uh, and that is miserable. It is a miserable, sad book. I'm a little surprised that I enjoyed Tom Lake so much because it wasn't sad and miserable. But another book that is sad and miserable, but in a short little package is Emily St. John Mandel's first book, Last Night in Montreal. So we haven't had a chance to talk about this yet. Again, her first book, it came out in, I want to say 2009. That sound good? Let's see. Yes, 2009. So this book talks about a child, a girl who was abducted by her father in the middle of the night and they spend the next nine years on the run. Just the two of them trying not to be caught. And then we get to know her as an adult and what the repercussions of that abduction are in her adulthood. Her name is Lilia and we, when we first meet her, she is living with Eli in New York City. And we will digest a large part of the book with Eli in it. And I should say, the abduction was done in Canada, but the father was a U.S. citizen and the child was had dual citizenship. So they're on the run mainly in the United States. But we have a police detective, well, police detective turned private detective from Canada who is on this case. 
and he becomes obsessed with it. So we'll see how that plays out. That's the essential part of the plot you need to know. This book, I, I, I have trouble talking about it. It's Emily St. John Mendel's first book, and yet I feel like her writing is still excellent in this book. So I have, I've read now four of her six books, so I still need to read her second and third books, which I will do. But I, I loved her writing. And I even enjoyed the story she crafted and how she crafted it. I, I thought that was great. But this was not a book, again, not long. It's not a long book. Uh, 200 and it's 229 pages. And yet it took me a while to read it because I was never like, oh, I can't wait to get back to it. Like I have been with her other books. I didn't, I didn't feel that with this one. However, when I think of a star rating, there's no way I could give this three stars. And I can't give it five stars. So this ended up being a four star read for me. I'm so glad I read it. I, I want to be a completist with her, her novels. But when I thought about it, and I had just recently finished Tom Lake, so I started this, I think, just a few days after Tom Lake. The main feeling from this book is discontentment from every angle. And I love that. I love that. I Like I said, I love sad, miserable books. But I don't know. Maybe it was because I was in such a frame of mind from Tom Lake and even Our Town. Although Our Town has a bite. Like, don't just go into it thinking this is a happy, happy play. It's not. Like, it's kind of devastating, really. <laughs> but, but there's still this feeling of nostalgia from it <laughs> that really just makes me happy in general, even though, um, yeah, it's kind of a tragic play in a way. Not tragic like a Shakespearean tragedy, but tragic in a, in a Thornton Wilder kind of way. So maybe reading it so closely after Tom Lake may have affected my feelings toward the book. Like I said, there was no way I could give it just three stars. So that's got to say something. If you enjoy Emily St. John Mandel Station Eleven or The Glass Hotel or my favorite, Sea of Tranquility, definitely read this. It's very interesting to see where her writing started. So that is Last Night in Montreal. After that, I needed the comfort that one can only get from Agatha Christie. And I read I read a cute book. I, I think cute is the best way to describe her 19... 33 novel, Why Didn't They Ask Evans? The two main characters in Why Didn't They Ask Evans are in their 20s and they're gonna do their own sleuthing for a murder that Bobby, our male main character, came upon when he was out golfing in Wales one day. And his friend is his sidekick throughout the book. And his friend, Frankie, they, they grew up together, but Frankie is actually a lady and, and he's working class. They become the amateur sleuths to solve this murder mystery for us. Again, I listened to it on audio and it was delightful just delightful. Really no no need to say anything more. I, I gave it a, like a really strong four stars. Uh, just, just good old fun. That's what that one was. Okay, next I read Lisa Joel's most recent mystery thriller entitled None of This is True. And so this just came out 2023. It is, I have complicated feelings about this one. It's for me, it was definitely a page turner, which for a mystery thriller of contemporary times, that's a must. Do not give me a mystery thriller that's not a page turner. It was a page turner, but it was icky. Uh, I think icky is the most precise word to use, use in this case. It was icky in a lot of ways. Susan of 10 years ago and certainly of 20 years ago would not have read this book. One, I would have vetted it before I read it, but if I accidentally started it without knowing what it was about, which was a very rare occurrence when I was a younger reader, I, I would have stopped reading this very early on. It, it's just, uh, ugh. but um, I gotta say, I was, I was compelled by this book. I read it very quickly. And I, 
it would have been, despite its factor, it would have been a four star for me except for the ending. I don't want to ruin anything for you, so I don't feel like I can talk much about why the ending wasn't okay with me. I wish I would have read this with a book group and we could have debated what that ending was about all day long. Um, yeah, so if you enjoy contemporary mystery thrillers and you are not a sensitive reader, I say definitely read this one. Definitely. And then message me <laughs> and let me know what you thought of the ending <laughs> because ugh, send me an Instagram message or something. I I'm, I went on to Goodreads, Goodreads because I'm like, okay, certainly people are going to be talking about this because you can do spoilery comments on Goodreads and, and it's okay because it's flagged as a spoiler. But I really didn't get any satisfaction from Goodreads either. But that end, I know what I think. I know what I think, but I may be wrong. <laughs> anyway, again, if you enjoy contemporary mystery thrillers and you're not a sensitive reader, definitely, yes, get it from your library. So my last read of August was a five-star read. I have had this book on my shelf. I think I bought it shortly after I got on BookTube. I want to say I bought it early in 2020. And it's just been sitting on my shelf. I haven't had the desire to read it all this time. And then I, I, I pulled it off the shelf. And what perfect timing. Because the book is set in the fall. It's set in the fall of 1960. And this is not a work of fiction. It is John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie. So this is like a travel log slash memoir. However, if you're going to read it, keep in mind Steinbeck is a novelist at heart. Like the introduction to the edition I have, which I think is the 50th anniversary edition. Oh, I have it right here. What am I doing? Uh, which is the 50th anniversary edition. The introduction, the person who wrote that, Jay Perini, he explained. He reminds us, you know, Steinbeck's a novelist at heart. I mean, he's Grapes of Wrath, East of Eden, The Pearl. So he does take literary license with the facts. <laughs> so while technically this is nonfiction, just keep that in mind. But the reason I even picked this up is I intend to be doing some traveling through the winter, through the, hopefully through... Uh, late fall and into the winter. And this is Travels with Charlie. I've known about this book for years. Like I said, I bought it a few years ago. And basically it, it talks about Steinbeck wanted to get back in touch with America. I mean, he had been overseas a lot um, on different assignments and he felt like he was out of touch with the people of the United States and with the landscape. So he had a custom made truck with a camper embedded, mounted onto the truck. He did not want a travel trailer. He didn't want anything he had to tow. He wanted it all, all contained within this, uh, within this truck. And, and that's what he did. And he wanted to go alone because as much as he loved his wife and loved the comforts of his home, he, he thought to really accomplish what he wanted to accomplish, he needed to go solo. Although his wife does come and meet him. Uh, he talks about it a couple of times in the book, but apparently she did it more often than, than he mentions, according to the introduction. But basically, he, he starts at his Sag Harbor, New York home, goes up to Maine, and then works his way back down and across the upper states, all the way over to Washington State, and then down to California over to Texas, through the South, and back home. At the time, Steinbeck is 58 years old. Like I said, he is, he is doing this travel in the fall of 1960, which if you're a student of American history, you know this is when the Kennedy-Nixon campaign is going on. So a very interesting time just with that. But it's also at the dawn of this decade of the 1960s, this very turbulent decade here in the United States. So that is interesting too. And 
What is also interesting, although disheartening, are a lot of the concerns Steinbeck has as he's going a across the country are concerns we still have today. They haven't been settled. So in a way, this book is charming and poetic. And in another way, it's disheartening and tragic, especially the way not the very, very end, but near the end, the way he decides to handle that near ending is very, very disheartening and disturbing. After you've gone through such a poetic journey for the most part with him. And I think that says a lot for the times he was writing this in. And like I said, um, we really haven't solved much since then. In fact, we've just created more issues <laughs> I loved it. It was five stars. I love to travel. I love to drive. I love road trips. I prefer it if I'm driving on the road trip. I love road trips alone. I, I, I Kind of, maybe, maybe that's a fun fact about me, or maybe you can relate. Maybe you also love to drive. Maybe you love going on long road trips. I just think they're the best. Some of the best times in the last you know, seven years of my life have been some of these road trips I've been on, whether with Bill or by myself. And when I say by myself, I mean with Zuzu. Oh, and I should say, travels with Charlie. Charlie is his French poodle <laughs> that, that he takes with him. And that really adds a very, I don't know, comforting, adorable element <laughs> to the book because he just loves his dog. He loves his dog. So that was also very relatable. I love traveling with Zuzu. She is such a good little traveler. And it also opens people up to conversation that maybe you wouldn't have um, if, if the dog weren't with you. So that's kind of cool. Speaking of opening yourself up to conversation, I should say, like Steinbeck, when he's traveling, he wants to talk to people. Uh, he's not looking to like get on the expressway and take the quickest, you know, drive from point A to point B. He's actually driving very slowly and trying not to get on the expressways. And he's, he wants to talk to people. It's, it's all very interesting. Have you read Travels with Charlie? If you have, let me know in the comments. I would, I would love to hear what you thought of that book. That that is August reading, but we're not done. Don't, don't stop the video yet because I have a hypothetical question that I heard in another YouTube video and I want to hear your answers in the comments. So please let me know in the comments how you would answer this hypothetical. So quickly, by way of background, I heard this. If you follow the Goulet pens, so... You know, I'm getting into fountain pens. So I have been watching their podcast, which they call Pen Casts, of course. And in episode 83, now the pen casts are long. So if you want to watch this part of their video, go to one hour, seven minutes and 25 seconds. That will get you at the point where the hypothetical question is posed. For us readers, we may have different responses than the, the two guys, Brian Goulet and Drew Brown did in their <laughs> answers. So here it is. Now, this was an AI created hypothetical, which they, they're, they're really investigating the whole AI thing. And I know I need to do that too. Here it is. Would you rather be able to speak and understand every human language fluently, but lose the ability to read and write or be able to read and write in every language but lose the ability to speak and understand spoken words automatically when i heard that read i'm like of course i'd rather number two <laughs> There was no question in my mind, but just as there was no question in my mind that I would prefer number two, at least on first blush, upon first hearing the hypothetical question, <laughs> one of the guys in the podcast, he's like, of course, he was just as certain he would rather number one. <laughs> and once he gave his explanation, he's like, I gotta be able to speak to my kids. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, that's that, <laughs> there's that. But for us who are readers, 
would we be rather be able to speak? I mean, like, forget uh, that part of it is just fluently in every language. Let's just say even it's just ours. <laughs> would you rather be able to speak or would you rather be able to read and write? Am I crazy that my gut reaction was number two? And does that make me a bad person? It definitely makes me an introvert. <laughs> I wanna hear your answers below. I am so interested to see where this landed with you. Here, I'll just read it really quickly one more time. Would you rather be able to speak and understand every human language fluently, but lose the ability to read and write, or would you rather to be able to read and write in every language, but lose the ability to speak and understand spoken words? Okay, that is the question. <laughs> Please leave me a comment below and let me know. And that will wrap up today's video. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I'm gonna be back very soon because I have other things we need to talk about. But until then, happy reading. Hope you all are enjoying the beginning of September and I will see you again soon. Bye.